All right, so this is the first lesson in chapter three, which focuses on polynomial functions. Now polynomials, that's a f term you've been using since grade nine especially, and you've been working with polynomials a lot since grade nine. Algebraically, most, most algebraic work you've done you've since grade eight uh, has really been dealing with polynomials. Um, what's really new about this is we want to think about first what makes a polynomial again and the characteristics of them thinking of them as a group of functions. Uh, so first, let's start off with something that is probably pretty unhelpful, and that is the proper definition of a polynomial. And a polynomial uh, is any function that can be shown like this. Got it? Great. So let's 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 bring your attention to a few things. Uh, first of all, what we have here, all of these, a so on. These are all the coefficients. So a subscript n is like really just these are just different coefficients um, and so if we look here they can be any real number okay so a polynomial function has coefficients that's really what this says a series of coefficients how many well it depends there's this little dot 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 right here um, so we don't know how many terms it has but one thing is it usually has some co sort of coefficients well that's not terribly helpful what else a polynomial function has your input your x in this case being raised to powers but not just any powers, powers that are whole numbers. And a whole number means no fractions, no negatives. So a polynomial function has inputs that are raised to whole number exponents. Um, and the largest number, which I have here is n, we call the degree of the polynomial. Hopefully that sounds familiar. You kind of work, you kind of are first introduced to the degree in grade nine. Um, whereas again, x in this case is the independent variable. Right, all of these are the same input being raised to different powers, all the way down to the final term, which is some coefficient times x to the power of zero. You may want to remember that anything to the power of zero equals one. Um, essentially, a raising something to the power of zero means dividing by itself. And so if this equals one, then really this final term is just a coefficient times one, which makes us a constant. So that's your constant term. All right, so just that said, uh, I'm not saying that's that's great now, but it's probably better than it was before. Um, and so what I have here now are nine functions, which ones are polynomials. So anything that can be written in the form you see above here is a polynomial. More importantly, I don't really, like I always say, <laughs> definitions are fine, but that's not the best way of understanding something. And so if you just look at these, hopefully we can develop a feeling about which ones are polynomials. And the reason that matters is if something is not a polynomial, everything we're talking about in this chapter won't apply to it. If something is a polynomial, everything we're talking about in this chapter does apply to it. So let's look at the first one. A of x equals 2. Is that a polynomial? It is. So I'm going to circle it. Uh, for example, I could rewrite this if I wanted to as, an, as 2 times x to the power of 0. Um, they're equivalent. And so that does match this definition up here. I never said there had to be you know, more than one term. Um, and again, in this case, you know, it ne never says how many terms there has to be. One is the minimum. If you have no terms, you don't have a function. And so this is about as simple as it gets. This is a polynomial of degree 0, because it's equivalent to x to the power of 0. So this is a polynomial of degree 0. OK, uh, we call that a constant polynomial. Uh, that's it. I don't really want to talk about it much more, because it's so incredibly simple, just the function equals 2. It's a horizontal line of 2 uh, that I don't even feel the need to talk about anymore. Uh, what about b of x? Is this a polynomial? And it is. Uh, we have a square root of something, but that's OK. That's the coefficient. We have a coefficient of 2. Um, this is a polynomial. This is a polynomial of degree 2, which is what we call a quadratic function. All quadratic functions are a type of polynomial. So degree 2 and we know these are called quadratics. So every single quadratic function you worked with in grade 11 was a type of polynomial. Like I said, you've been dealing with polynomials a lot. C is not a radical function. Sorry, it's not a polynomial function. It's a polynomial function inside a radical function. Um, but it's not a polynomial function on its own. Remember, a squ we may recall a square root can be expressed as a power of 1 half. And if you look back up here, your inputs, your x, all have to be raised to powers that are whole numbers, never a fraction of some sort. So as soon as you see x being raised to a, inside a radical, it's not a polynomial. OK, so I'm going to leave that. d is a polynomial. It's a linear function. It's degree 1. 
And so all linear functions are types of polynomials. And that was your focus from grade 10. I guess, like I keep saying, you've been dealing with these a lot. Uh, e. It's hard to tell at first, but let me simplify this down. If I take E and I break this up like this, I get if I break this up into two terms, I get x cubed over x minus 3 over x, which is the same as x squared minus, only one thing we want to remember, both. when you're dividing by x is the same as x to the power of negative 1. That goes back to grade 10 work with negative exponents. Students tend to forget that. Um, but remember, negative exponents essentially mean repeatedly dividing. So x to the negative 1, or anything to the power of negative 1, means dividing by x once. And so if I look at it like this, it may look like a polynomial, but again, I have x to a negative power. And if you look at the definition, the powers of x have to always be whole numbers. And whole numbers don't include negative, so this is not a polynomial. This is a type of rational function, which we look at in chapter 9 of this course. F. This one is going to be a polynomial, because if I do the same thing, I can break this up into x cubed over 3 minus 3 over 3, which is the same as 1 third times x cubed minus 1. That's a polynomial. This is a cubic polynomial. So this is a polynomial. It's degree 3, and we call it a cubic polynomial. All right, last three. g of x. Uh, this is a polynomial. The degree is 10. The degree is the highest power on x, as long as it's a whole number. And so I'm sure someone came up with a fancy Latin phrase for what we call a 10th degree polynomial. But we'll just call it a 10th degree polynomial. All right, next one. This is not a polynomial. The input is of the the input, I should say, of the absolute value part. That, what I've highlighted in green, is a polynomial. It's a quadratic polynomial. But it's all inside absolute value brackets. This is not a polynomial. Lastly, the denominator here is a polynomial, but not the whole thing. Okay, This is, again, uh, not a polynomial. It is a type of rational function. So polynomials essentially can, they don't have to be written like this here. But there's always a way of writing it like this, where generally we usually put the highest power first, and we work our way down to the constant last. Like That's the constant. All right. So. What I want to focus on are the graphs of these things. And so uh, with a, for each of these, I want to state the type of function. And for that, I'm just using like the phrase um, the, for the particular degree. The degree and the, what, I'm, what is the end behavior, which may be a new phrase for you. Um, as well, I want to talk about the maximum number of x-intercepts different functions can have. So first of all, what I have here is a quadratic function. And like I said, all quadratic functions are examples of polynomial functions. Okay, So this type of function, the name, is a quadratic. And I do expect us to know that. And quadratic function is a degree 2 polynomial. Okay, End behavior. End behavior is a way of describing the ends of a function. Now, if you look at this, this function has no end in many ways. It goes on forever. But you can kind of think about these as being the ends and that they just keep going, in this case, this direction. This particular function, these arrows, tell us that this particular function keeps going forever in quadrant 2 in that direction and forever in quadrant 1 in that direction. Um, that's what those arrows tell us. And so the end behavior is pretty much what I just said. It's quadrant 2 to quadrant 1. Um, you know, this, it's not, this function doesn't turn around at some point and go another direction. Quadratic functions don't do that. And so the way we describe, essentially, these arrows, the way we describe is this function keeps going on and on forever, is we say this particular function goes from quadrant 2 to quadrant 1. So quadrant 2 to quadrant 1. And to be honest, it doesn't matter which way you look at it, so I'm going to put a two-sided arrow right there. And that, what I just wrote down, is a way of describing what happens to this particular, in this case, quadratic function, as it just goes on and on and on towards its ends, which is, again, perhaps kind of silly because it has no end. That's it. Um, let's look at this cubic function, we call this. And so let me draw a little arrow heads here. And so this is what we call a third degree polynomial, which I can tell by looking at the biggest power on x. And again, we call this a cubic function. So 
This is just one example of a cubic function, which is degree 3. Just like the previous example here, not all parabolas look exactly like this. Um, they don't all have to open up, for example, but they all have this sort of general shape in common, and they all have an equation with x to the power of 2 as the highest power. So all cubic functions don't have to look like this, um, but they have a few things in common. And again, the highest power on x is 3. So the end behavior for this particular function is paying attention to this and this. I would say the end behavior is quadrant 1 to quadrant 3, or quadrant 3 to quadrant 1. Because that's where the function keeps going on and on forever at some point. It stops turning around at that point. So I'll say quadrant 3 to quadrant 1. Nothing I'll say about this is that in grade 11, instead of using the phrase end behavior, we usually talked about, you know, you could have been introduced to that, but usually we talk about parabolas opening up or opening down. And that's because it's, it's just simpler to say. Uh, if a parabola, parabola opens up, the end behavior is quadrants 1 and 2. If a parabola opens down, it has end behavior in 3 and 4. We didn't use that phrase because it's probably easier just to say opens up and opens down. And for quadratics, they're perfectly equivalent. Notice. If I look at this cubic function, open up and open down doesn't make sense anymore because it kind of does both. This part opens up, this part opens down, so we can't use that phrase anymore. And that's why end behavior we start using more. Because again, just the simplicity of opens up and opens down doesn't make sense for a function like this. All right. Uh, oh, I wrote that in the wrong spot there. Hold on. End behavior quadrant 3 to quadrant 1. Now. One thing I didn't mention before, because we've worked with quadratics so much, is the x-intercepts. Now, this particular function has three x-intercepts, here, here, and here. And that is the maximum number of x-intercepts a quadratic function can have. It doesn't have to have three, though. Just like a quadratic function here, this one has two, but don't think all quadratic functions have to have two. Two is the most. And so the maximum number of x-intercepts a cubic function can have is three. But that's the maximum. Okay, it is possible to have less than three. And these are things we want to keep be talking about as lessons go on. But it'll never have more than three. All right, let's look at this one. This is a fourth degree polynomial, which I can tell by mostly just looking at the equation. Notice there's more and more going on here. Please don't think that all fourth degree polynomials look like this, though. Um, but this is what we call a quartic function. Although I'm now caring less and less about you knowing that phrase. We should know quadratic. We should know linear. We should know cubic. I don't really care if you know the term quartic, as long as you know the degree, which is degree 4. The end behavior here for this particular function is quadrants 1 and 2. Again, I, opening up, opening down doesn't make sense, because again, it kind of does both. So end behavior is quadrants 1 and 2. I'll write it in the right spot this time. What's the maximum number of x-intercepts this will have? As you can probably guess, it'll have 4 is the most. And that's what we're seeing right here. This particular function has 4 x-intercepts. And a fourth degree polynomial, a quartic polynomial, will never have more than 4. But it doesn't have to have 4. For example, just notice, if I take this function and I move, if I translate it up a number of units by adding something to this 12, then eventually this will have no x-intercepts. If I just imagine a vertical translation up some number of units, whatever. I mean, I don't have anything labeled on this x and y axis. So again, that's the maximum number. You'll never have more than four, but it could have less. And now I could go on forever. We could spend the rest of our lives just working our way up to degrees. Uh, this will be the last one I show. And so this is degree five. The end behavior we can see, hopefully with a decent degree of confidence. And the x-intercepts, I can see this particular one has, what do you know? five x-intercepts, and that's the most. Um, and so let's write these things down. The type of function is called a quintic, but again, I don't really care. What I care is that it's degree five. The end behavior in this case is quadrant three to quadrant one. And the maximum number of x-intercepts in this case was five, the maximum. So before I start kind of generalizing some of these things, notice. Uh, I, I, while I only have four examples I gave you, uh, in terms of end behavior, you can kind of see a lot of things in common between um, the functions that have an odd degree and the functions that have an even degree. For example, power of 5, power of 3, 
both odd degree powers. Um, and they both have end behavior that's going in opposite sort of corners of quadrants, in this case, three and one. Although again, if we take this entire thing and flip it over with a vertical reflection, it'll now look something like this. So don't assume all cubic functions have to have that exact same end behavior, but they will always have end behavior that are going in kind of opposite quadrants, in this case, one and three, or it could be two and four. Whereas even degree functions, uh, either a quadratic, which you're familiar with, or in this case, a quartic, um, they have end behavior that they're always kind of going up together or going down together. In this case, it was quadrants one and two, but if I reflect the whole thing vertically, you know, it's going to look something like this. It's going to be quadrants three and four. And so the similarities about we see about polynomial functions are kind of can be grouped into whether they're even or odd functions. And so I can also use this to talk about the maximum number of roots. And so in general, if we have an nth degree polynomial, what's going to keep coming up in this is really what matters quite often is the polynomial an even degree or an odd degree. If it's an odd degree, like, like a cubic or a linear, linear functions are an odd degree polynomial. Then the maximum number of roots they can have, and where roots is like x-intercepts, is whatever the degree is. That's the maximum number. The minimum number, though, is always going to be 1. If it's degree 1, linear function, I don't care how you draw a first degree linear function, it has to cross the x-axis somewhere. So the and that's the same for you know any odd degreed function. Uh, for example, if I can draw a cubic function like this, where it kind of comes up and goes like this, you know, it still has just one, but I can't have it with none. Whereas with an even degreed function, like a quadratic function or a fourth degreed function, it is possible to have no roots. And so the maximum is n, whatever the degree is. If it's degree 12, the most number of roots it can have is 12 but the least number it can have is zero. So even degree polynomials don't have to have any x-intercepts. Odd degree ones always do. All right, so the final problem, which leads us into the next few lessons, um, is about I want to sketch these functions, paying attention to really their roots. And for each of these, I, as it says here, all I care about is the general shape the, and the x-intercepts. Oh, and the end behavior. Okay, but I do not care about where the vertices are or drawing my graphs of scale. And so let's start with a quadratic function. If I want to visualize this, for what I'm at, if I'm really paying attention to the general shape and x-intercepts, well, x-intercepts especially, I want to factor this, ideally. And so if this can be factored, I can see my x-intercepts quite nicely, and this can be factored. And so this factors into x plus 4 and x minus 1, which means I know this function has x-intercepts at negative 4 and positive 1. Okay, I'm starting with the quadratics because if we can remember some of the basics from quadratics, we can apply it to other polynomials. Uh, what else do I know? It is a positive quadratic function. It's 1x squared, so it's opening up. So I can now visualize something looking like this. Now, where is the vertex? I don't care. Um, notice I made a point of drawing it. I mean, it's somewhere over here. But I'm not going to try to figure out where it is because I didn't ask for it. Um, as well, I want to make sure I don't try to draw it on the um, y-axis. Sometimes students, they draw it, and for some reason they force the vertex to be right there, which looks kind of wrong. I mean, parabolas are always symmetrical around the vertex. So you have learned enough from grade 11 using completing the square to figure out what the vertex is, but I do not care. And so I've drawn my end behavior. My end behavior are those two arrows in this case, and I'm done. Okay. Um, however, if I wanted to be a little more detailed, I could show where the y-intercept is. And you may recall the y-intercept of a quadratic function can be found by looking at its constant term. And so negative 4 is my y-intercept. And since that's pretty easy to see there, and it's pretty easy for me to draw, I'll just label it right there. Okay, that's quadratics. I want to do the same thing for this cubic function. This time, though, again, I I don't have as much background. I don't expect you to have as much background in what this looks like. So we may be a little more unsure about things, but the first thing we want to do is try factoring this. And so I'm going to factor out, in this case, an x or negative x. I can take out either. And so if I factor out a negative x, I think it makes my life a little bit easier. 
So I have x squared minus x plus, oh sorry, plus x minus 12, except to go to negative. Now I don't have to factor out that negative in front of the x, but it makes my next step a bit easier, which is factoring this. And that factors into x plus 4 and x minus 3. And now I can look at, all, at this and determine the basics of this graph. So first of all, x-intercepts, I can see, are at negative 4, positive 3, and 0. OK. Um, next, uh, the end behavior. Well, it's degree 3. Uh, but there's a negative in the front, or I can see this negative right here. And so that's, you know, if, if this was a positive, okay, I'll change that in a second. If that was a positive, this would look something like this. It would have the same end behavior as the example we saw in our notes. But there's a negative in the front, so the whole thing is flipped over. The end behavior is the reverse of that. So let me get rid of all these little, get rid of these little plus signs here. There we go. And so the end behavior is going to be the other way around. It's going to start in quadrant 2. I'll make this purple. Start in quadrant 2. Then it has to go turn around somewhere, go through here, turn around somewhere, and go down. And it must look like this. Now, where are these vertices right here and here? I don't care. To be honest, uh, once, you are, once you're dealing with a cubic function, to figure out where those are, you either need to just graph them in Desmos or you need to learn differential calculus, which is part of the next course. And clearly, I'm not going to cover that in this course. So I will never, never, in this course, will I ask you where a vertex is um, for a polynomial function, unless it's a quadratic function, or I give you something else. Uh, but just giving you an equation like this, to find those vertices is beyond the scope of this course. And honestly, in this case, I. I just really quickly got a quick little sketch of what this looks like um, using some factoring and paying attention to end behavior. And so that's all I really needed. Okay, um, By paying attention to the end behavior there, I can know the general shape. I don't need to know where those vertices are. And so the last one, which may look like the, it's the most difficult, but it's already been factored, which is quite pleasant. Um, and so let me show the x-intercepts first. So x-intercepts at negative 5, negative 3, positive 2, and positive 4. OK. What else do I know? I know this is degree 4. If I was to FOIL this all out, my first term would be negative 4, not 4, take that back. My first term would be negative x to the power of 4, and so on. Um, I'd Please, please, please don't FOIL this all out. But it's Hopefully we can just realize if you were, at some point you go x times x times another x times another x. At some point you would multiply all these x's together. Uh, it would be a lot of steps, but at some point you get x to the power of 4, because the whole thing has a negative in the front, I have a negative there. So I know that this is degree 4, which is an even number. Um, and so I know the end behavior is either both going to go up or it's both going to go down. So it's either going to be quadrants 2 and 1 or quadrants 3 and 4. I know it's one of those two. Well, because of that negative in the front, I know it's going to be like this, quadrants 3 and 4. If it was a positive in the front, it would be quadrants 2 and 1. So I now know, without even paying attention to anything else, that the end behavior of this function is going to be quadrants 3 and 4. So it's going to go down here somewhere and down here somewhere. I'll put those little arrows for now. OK, so with that said, um, I can do most everything else really quickly now. I know where my end behavior is, so I know it must go up. It has to turn around somewhere. Uh, then it has to turn around somewhere down here and go back up. And then it has to turn around and go back down. And that has to be it, because there's no more x-intercepts. So I'll drop my arrows for end behavior. I'll erase these little things here. And I've got pretty much everything I want. However, one last thing I can do that's fairly easy is I can find my y-intercept. If I look right now, my y-intercept is down here somewhere. It's negative something. It's not too hard to figure out what it is. Um, your y-intercept can be found by either looking at the constant term, if it's all in that particular form, but it's, it's in factored form. So if I want to find my 
constant term. Remember, all I have to do is take x and replace it with 0. And in the, I will know my constant term, like your x, so your y-intercept for any function is re by replacing x with 0. So in this case, um, if I replace x with 0, I get 5 times 3 times negative 4 times negative 2, which is 120. But there's a negative in the front, so my y-intercept is negative 120. little extra there. Okay, whereas if it was written in one of these forms, I could see the y-intercept by looking at the constant term. And as well, look at notice this one right here. There is no constant term. So you can imagine it's plus 0, which we already see in our graph, which matches up with our graph. Right? So y-intercepts, usually pretty easy to find, especially for polynomials. If it's in this standard form, you can just see the y-intercept as, as the coefficient of the term without an x, or just the constant term, we call it. And if it's not in that, if it's not in that sort of standard form, just replace x with 0, which is usually a pretty nice number to replace it with. All right, so the key parts of this lesson before I stop this is understanding uh, a little bit what makes a polynomial a polynomial, but mostly starting to get a sense about how the graphs of these polynomials can be you know, somewhat visualized from paying attention to the degree, whether the leading coefficient is positive or negative, and of course the factors. And all of these things come back to quadratics to some extent. So hopefully that helps a bit.